we're starting right on schedule as per graduate student time. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to the third panel that we've had at the Games Institute, but for the first time ever, we have two faculty members as our panelists. Um, before we get started, I'm going to open with the land acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather today is the land traditionally used by the Attawandran, Anishinaabeg, and Haudenosaunee peoples. The University of Waterloo is situated on the Haldimand Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes 10 kilometers on each side of the Grand River. We also acknowledge the enduring presence and deep traditional knowledge, laws, and philosophies of the indigenous peoples with whom we share this land today. So you are here at the Games Institute, and most of you are already familiar with what we do here, but the quick elevator pitch is that we are a multidisciplinary research center at the University of Waterloo with graduate students and a handful of undergraduate students who are doing some type of games related and interactive related, um, interactive technologies related research. And the graduate students here um, thrive because of their professors and the faculty members and the larger network of researchers who are further along in their academic career. Today we're joined by two um, games, games research professors, uh, Dr. Gerald Voorhees and Dr. Leonard Naka. And Gerald is from the um, Communication Arts Department and Leonard is from, he's a human computer interaction professor. So rather than uh, me introducing them, I've tasked them with preparing their own little spiel about what they do. So please introduce yourselves and explain how your research and teaching relates to games and talk a little bit about how you got into researching games in the first place. Sure, I'll start. Um, my name is Gerald Voorhees and uh, I've been researching games for about 12 years, um, if you count the dissertation writing years. Um, but uh, I have, I, I'm researching games for the simple reason that um, they are uh, a near ubiquitous cultural phenomena that demands attention um, in the same way that um, anything, any fad, trend, uh, thing, that phenomena that captures public attention and starts to become a uh, part of hundreds of millions of people's everyday life practices, uh, you know, deserves to be understood in, in all its dimensions. Um, I teach classes um, in the Department of Communication Arts uh, primarily, um, and those classes, uh, unfortunately, they're not games classes, uh, although I am this term uh, teaching a game design class in the Digital Arts Communication minor. Um, <clears throat> But my teaching is primarily in the area of public communication, uh, mediated communication, uh, and communication and social justice. Um, in those courses, uh, we are interrogating how communication processes and very specific communication practices um, are participating in the construction of publics and the construction of arguments to publics, uh, including, yes, video games designed first and primarily for entertainment. Um, and we're also considering how the communicative dimensions of these games are taken up um, in order to say things um, about uh, both contemporary politics and social situations, um, as well as how they might say things about imagined futures um, that we haven't quite pinned down yet. Um, and <clears throat> um, I uh, primarily take a um, um, a perspective that is informed by several different approaches. Um, I consider myself a critical scholar rather than an interpretive or a human humanistic scholar. Um, and uh, by that, I mean that I'm invested in interrogating how relations of power and inequity um, are created and maintained by um, our social practices, our popular culture, um, the small uninterrogated things that need further examination me thanks um, yeah my name is uh, dr. Naka I'm a, you could say a human computer interaction researcher uh, Gerald and I actually share the department share a department we're just uh, um, from <laughs> very different backgrounds um, I guess yeah I started researching games in about 2003 so that makes it 15 years now I feel old uh, <laughs> but um, yeah so I've 
uh, always enjoyed uh, as a child, obviously, playing games and then um, as a researcher just um, looking f first at the technical aspects of games. So I came to games through a school of game design, game development. My background was computer science. Uh, so I really kind of studied, um, you know, how to make games uh, technically, um, all of the mathematical aspects of games. Um, then later during my PhD, I switched over to the um, uh, if, uh, effect kind of uh, research to look at the effect that games have on people and sort of had more of a psychological slant to uh, my investigation. So I started doing user studies and uh, th I think that's pretty common in HCI that you look at things from a technical perspective but you also run a lot of user studies and you look at the impact of things, uh, the experience, specifically in this case player experience. Um, what does it mean um, when you're experiencing s certain emotions during a game? Um, which is why it's always fantastic to talk to Gerald um, and sort of get, get sort of the different experience. Because Gerald, being a critical scholar, kind of you know uh, helps me ground some of my ideas when I you know look at a game and I say, okay, yeah, this. Uh, you know, I'm studying it from a perspective where I'm saying, okay, there's, you know, I feel like there is a high impact there um, for the player, and they're really engaging in that moment. And then Gerald can help me contextualize in that moment and kind of say, yeah, you know, that's probably, you know, there there are some underlying currents here. If you look in the literature and you you look like there, you know, the people might be interpreting their gender roles or some other things. Uh, so. Uh, I'm actually really looking forward to this discussion because it's, uh, you know, it's always good to uh, inform um, some of the aspects that you see sort of as a result of your user study or of your technical study and then contextualize it broader in the socioeconomic context, uh, which is not necessarily something that we do in you know, our everyday research, but it is something that I think makes our practice as human computer interaction researchers much richer. Um, and I think in HCI we're pretty open-minded and we, we like to get input from other disciplines. We're, I don't even know if we are a discipline. We are like a mishmash of disciplines. We're sort of, you know, like in the intersection of, of things. Um, so, yeah, I guess kind of, I didn't really introduce my research, but that's my research. My research is kind of looking at these different aspects um, of user experience in video games. And um, I'm going to unpack some of that, specifically from a design lens, as well as from a user research lens as we go um, over the game and, and look at it in detail. And so, yeah, this kind of, I guess, helps locate both of us. Good. Um, so you've heard a bit about them. I am Marisa Benjamin, and I'm going to be the moderator today. Um, I work here at the Institute. I do research communication, so it's my job to kind of be aware of the different research that's happening here. And we do these panels so that we can showcase the interdisciplinary research of, uh, the interdisciplinary nature of the research. and to point out the different ways that the disciplines can collaborate and learn from one another, as uh, Dr. Naka said. So we talked about what game we're going to be looking at, and you told me that you wanted to look at Spider-Man. And I played a bit of Spider-Man. I, I played about 10 hours in total over different stints. Um, rather than me introduce the game to the audience, I'm actually going to have you introduce the game and explain why you chose it. Do we want to do that together? So this is a uh, this is a process that has been going on for a while. So Gerald and I we both play games, and sometimes we chat about the games that we play. And uh, I think oftentimes we usually actually complain to each other that because of our jobs we don't actually have as much time to play games anymore as we used to when we were younger. Um, but I think that's just the nature of it. And so we we kind of sat down um, one of those nights that we were hanging out playing games and looked at some of our libraries of games that were available. Gerald talked about some of the games that he's played. I talked about some of the games that I've played. And, and he, he like, again, we went through a bunch of them on the list, and he recommended Spider-Man saying this was a more recent approach, and he truly enjoyed the experience. Mm -hmm. And I'm, of course, a sucker for positive emotional experiences in games, so I, I wanted to know, you know, what is it that makes that game so special, specifically with um, a title that's a high franchise title, so that's not necessarily um, usual, like sometimes you have re really strong or new IPs and you, you go in and say, okay, that's really, you know, like uncharted, like I can put something on that game, I know what it is. But in this case, Spider-Man, there have been lots of Spider-Man games in the past, and so not necessarily all of them were big successes. Both of us have played Spider-Man games in the past, and so um, I guess that's kind of where that curiosity came from. He said he's willing to um, replay it and reanalyze it, and then we just went for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we actually um, we actually looked at a large number of games from the last five years, and we narrowed it down to 
um, you know, a handful of games from the past year and, and a few more from the past several years that were more prominent that we could still, you know, say is big enough to be considered recent. Um, um, but, uh, but ultimately, yeah, we decided to, to go for Spider-Man because, um, you know, among, uh, among other things, yes, I had already played it and could not recommend it enough to Leonard, but um, among other things, it, uh, it, it got really, really high Metacritic ratings. Um, uh, I, um, and I, I believe, this may just be an anecdote, but, but I believe they are some of the highest Metacritic ratings for 2018. Wow. Um, and um, beyond that, uh, this is a game that um, <clears throat> I read a number of reviews. Uh, I didn't read a negative review of this game. Um, it was overwhelmingly positive, and the follow-up, uh, unlike a lot of games that debut and then the follow-up is criticism about X, Y, or Z, the follow-up for this was uh, why isn't there this fanboy suit that I like. <laughs> it was the only criticism, uh, rather than, you know, people talking about uh, game design, mechanics, representation, etc. Um, and so I think that both because it was incredibly popular, because it was reviewed incredibly well, and because it's sort of a, not a blank slate, but a blanker slate than many in terms of research and criticism and thinking about the game, I think it provides a great opportunity in that way. Yeah, so Spider-Man um, by Insomniac Games was released in 2018, and it's a different interpretation of Spider-Man in that it's no longer an origin story. Now you're starting, and he's 23, I believe. So uh, it starts off, he's in his apartment, he wakes up, and there's you know a rent due notice that slides under his door. But for the most part, he already is familiar with his powers, and he is after he's graduated. Um, post-secondary education, so he has a job and he's a scientist and he develops a lot of his own equipment. Um, so it's really interesting in this way because it's an adaptation of Spider-Man um, and yet you're starting at a different point and um, you have the opportunity to play throughout New York in this new mode. So yeah, I think there's a lot that you can unpack here and I'm excited to get started. And yeah. did you want to start off by showing some of the playthroughs that you have? Uh, yeah, I actually I streamed uh, every minute of me playing that game privately. Nobody watched. Um, nobody usually watches my gaming streams. That's fine. <laughs> uh, I have some grad students that occasionally drop in, and uh, probably check whether, <laughs> whether I've read their thesis or I'm playing a game. But um, yeah, so this was really just more for archival purposes. Um, I think uh, the, the way that we've structured this, just to kind of give everyone a little bit of an outline, is we wanted to talk about narrative and representation first, then move over to design mechanics, and then talk a little bit more about player experience and our interpretations of it. And so I think um, the segue that you gave us here in terms of uh, narrative um, is quite interesting because the, um, for me, at least, when I picked up the game, it, it felt like picking up a comic, right? Like when you pick up the Spider-Man comics, uh, it is usually that. You, you don't pick up an origin story every time you, you play it, and that's kind of annoying with some of the movies and the reboots and stuff. Yeah, uh, yet another. Gerald and I actually just recently we watched a movie and we were just like, man, yet another origin story, um, because you find that a lot. That you know people just feel like they need to read, they they need to spend an entire movie on exposition, and that's not really um, too enjoyable if you've you know been around in the genre for a while. So that felt fresh about this. Um, obviously, big draw for me was that he was a scientist. You know, he's working at Otto Octavius's lab and. Um, that's cool. I get to play a scientist, a superhero scientist, mind you. Uh, you know, that's a lot of identification going on there with uh, with the main character. Uh, it's great. <laughs> it was great for me. Um, jokes aside, um, it was, uh, and this is actually, I actually wanted to start off with an earlier one. This is kind of, um, sort of a little bit at the later. Uh, um, points in the game, and uh, at that point, Manhattan is already overrun by goons, and um, I wanted to just go a little bit further at the start. Maybe like this is a good one. Um, um, and this was what actually this was one of the first most annoying points in the game, um, where you had um, to fi fight. I, th I think it was one of the first enemies. I forgot his name again. The Herman, hermit. The her the the hermit, like the rocket dude, the guy that is just like always in front of you yep. with the with the rocket, and um, Spider-Man fans are gonna hate me because I forgot his name, and this is like probably sacrilegious. Anyways, um, I think 
uh, what what got me here was the game early on. It starts and uh, maybe I'm, I'm spinning. Yeah, Shocker, that's his name. Uh, Shocker escaped. Happened a lot that the Shocker escaped because the game at that point. Um, and, uh, sorry that I'm spinning from the narrative towards the design angle, but like uh, for me that was an interesting thing because the game at that point had not been training me a lot to do these chase sequences. It, there were some missions where you had to chase a, a moving car, but this was really the first time I actually had to master the swinging. And this is particularly anno annoying when you have sequences like that, where like when you're swinging through the the valleys of um, uh, of New York. Uh, that's actually a nice feeling, but um, for this particular mission, Chocker ends up jumping um, behind the buildings, and so you're swinging straight on a building, so you actually have to swing early enough so you get high enough so you can actually jump over the building instead of, uh, I instead of just being uh, stuck on the building, and then things are not happening fast enough. Um, yeah, that's maybe... Uh, yeah, this, these are just some of the early missions. This is the stuff that they train you for these missions with. You're chasing a car and then you have a quick time sequence where you're essentially trying to disarm the, the robbers in the car and then later on that usually ends with a fight and things like that. Uh, but this is how they trained you for that shocker event, like with these car sequences. As you notice, I'm not fast enough in pressing the buttons so the car falls on top of me. Uh, really quite lame. I eventually mastered that. Yeah. So this is the first part. Um, and this actually doesn't have a fight at the end of it, but usually it then ends it with a fight. So it, it trained you to do those chase sequences and the fights. Um, but that was sort of the early uh, start of the game. And I think I kind of totally ran into design instead of narrative there. But um, they're very integrated. Yeah. They, yeah. They kind of integrated. Um, I think interesting, maybe to give you a segue, um, was uh, I think that throughout the game, as you develop your skills and you develop the story, um, you obviously, spoiler alert, uh, you go from being friend with one of the main characters in the story and possibly working for that character without spoiling who it is, into that character turning into Dr. Octopus without spoiling who it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whoops! Um, anyways, and then you, you kind of um, fight that dude that was your friend. So, you know, like this has a whole, and, and uh, when we earlier talked about this game, there are so many segues of, uh, and, and references to popular culture and things. So I'm just going to pass it to Gerald asking, did you have a Darth Vader moment in there? I did not have a Darth oh, Vader moment. Okay. I did. Um, I am your father. Like the mentor becomes the enemy. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's that's interesting. Um, no, I no, I didn't have the Darth Vader moment, but there's there's an interesting um, take on on the phenomena of datification that that folks were talking about three or four years ago, right? Uh, traitorous father figures, um, but um, um, I, you know, to to think about the original question, um, you know, I I think that. Uh, Spider-Man could do that because Spider-Man is an established property, um, and and people could pick up Spider-Man without needing an origin story. Uh, and most people would pick up Spider-Man, and and as Leonard said, not actually want one uh, because uh, Spider-Man is a known entity, um, and um, you know beyond being intellectual property, he's a cultural phenomena. Uh, so, you know, I think that. Um, um, this game is able to get away, right, by with skipping the origin story. Um, unfortunately, uh, some things do feel a little bit awkward because there are traditional story beats where, um, you know, where in games will introduce, right, new mechanics um, or uh, new types of challenges, right? Um, and you don't see that in Spider-Man because um, the lead into the story is much faster, I think. Um, and so, um, you know, you get thrown into these street crimes, which are consequential in and of themselves, but ultimately are training you for the harder encounters with the Sable agents and the Fisk thugs and etc. cetera. Um, um, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't feel like that, it, at least for me, it didn't feel like that um, in the moment, right? Stepping back from it, I was able to identify, well, here we're being gradually led into the difficult and complexity of the fighting mechanics. Um, but as I was playing, it was, whoa, right into it already. <laughs> um, and, uh, but, but I think that, I guess that makes sense, uh, given that with the story, 
right into it already as well. Right. So uh, along those lines, to crack open a can of Campbell's soup here, um, uh, if we think about the hero's journey, um, is there sort of a, uh, a, th a, a crossing of the threshold that, that happens there? Because I, I think we both had an idea of, uh, and this will lead you in a nice segue to talk about gender and stereotypes, but um, I think uh, one of the things that's quite interesting is, again, a, a character that's very positive at the start of the game, uh, Mr. Lee, um, that you're working for in a shelter and you, you, you're kind of helping out. Um, at the mid-game, I would say it's about mid-game uh, sure. moment, um, yeah, mid uh, essentially leads us into, uh, uh, those of you that are familiar with the hero's journey, it's like the way is good, uh, the, the world is good, uh, there's maybe something wrong in the world, but then you're, 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 you're passing the threshold and you know, you're, you're, you're essentially getting into that other side of the world and now you have to do the trial of trials and, and go through all of that. So the interesting thing is we're going from sort of the world being kind of a good place, there's some crime, Again, it ties into the mechanics because we're, the crime is training us for solving the harder channels. But then all of a sudden, you know, Mr. Lee turns into Mr. Negative and becomes this, this evil villain. And you're uncovering that whole plot, which then also leads to the balance of the world being completely thrown off later on in the game. Because it changes from just street crimes to uh, there's a later sequence. Uh, I, I guess that's more when Octa Octavius enters the scene. Not to spoil again, uh, Doc Ock's appearance there. Whoops! Um, but and frees all the prisoners uh, in in um, the, the high security prison, which then leads to the prisoners running over the city, which then leads to essentially the world is changing completely, right? Yeah. Uh, so we have that interesting narrative journey there. From the world is kind of good. So so what do you think about this? The world being kind of good. Like for me, that was interesting. But again, I'm not a narrative scholar, but for me, that was an interesting experience going from, okay, everything's in order, everything's good, to first, uh, my first friend is bad, my second friend is bad, my mentors and, and good friends are bad, and the world is changing into a bad place, which I found, again, not from a scholarly perspective, but just from a player perspective, quite intriguing. Now, you as a scholar of these things, would you say that was well done? I'm not sure how I could answer that because I'm not actually a literary scholar. No, that's true. But um, you have definitely more ideas <laughs> about rhetorics than me. That's true. That's true. But I have not read Joseph Campbell since undergrad. So, um, uh, sure, sure, I guess. <laughs> um, one thing that um, one thing that I certainly can say is that. Um, um, the situation that you point out is an interesting one, um, right, where uh, normalcy, uh, the good old New York that we all know and love, uh, is the one that is dominated by street crime. Um, it, normalcy includes forays into beating up thugs, um, and, and yeah, that is, that is status quo, that is everyday life in this city. Um, that Spider-Man and all of its inhabitants love so much. Um, but uh, the, right, the disruption to that uh, is clearly it's a disruption, right? Um, but I think that what's, what's more telling, right, is, is what is considered normal in the first place. Um, and the way that the game presents that normal um, I think, and, and this has implications for player experience and, and effects, um, uh, to bring rhetoric back into it, there's, there's some autonomy working there between uh, the New York of that game and the real world that we inhabit. Um, and uh, the notion that the normalcy of a crime-ridden, dangerous, life or death is always, you know, in question city, um, the conflation of that sort of normalcy with this world, right? Um, especially when you start to look at the way that some people have discoursed about this game. Um, and, and I might save that, that aspect for a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> but, I think that, um, but I think that that is significant in itself, the way that it, it presents that as normalized. Um, and within the fantastical context of the video game, something like that can be normal and disrupted by apocalyptic stuff, right? Um, and um, we'll bat an eye, maybe, <laughs> but not much more. Um, um, and yeah, it's, it's uh, I, I, so I think that um, beyond whatever threshold, right, um, 
uh, the hero goes on, uh, the world itself, right, is rhetorically, right, passes that threshold um, for, for the player. Um, and, yeah, did that. You know what I find interesting, though, um, and again, I don't know enough about rhetorics, but like um, in terms of uh, the representation of the character, and, um, the, the metaphor that you choose to represent yourself as is up to you, right? Like all of the um, uh, all of the suits that Spider-Man can wear uh, unlock over the course of the game. But for example, there are uh, suits available uh, that you can actually unlock pretty early in the game if you do the according challenges that make you look more mature and more like, you know, the world's, or you're already more of a crime fighter than, you know, some of the suits that you unlock later would actually be more fitting towards a representation of teenage Spidey because like, for example, when you collect all the backpacks, you get that sort of that scruffy little uh, uh, sweater um, kind of suit and sort of the early, uh, you know, Spider-Man being. So like, in terms of visual representation or metaphorical representation, I don't know what you want to call it, um, I think that's uh, sort of that's interesting how that freedom is given to the player and not taken over by the narrative or by the story because they could have done that because uh, obviously they had the assets available um, but they chose not to. Yeah. Along these lines, sorry, before you jump in here, I want to add to it, maybe make it a little bit more complicated. So along these lines, um, when you're playing through the game, the people that you are fighting, most of the thugs, you'll see they were men, mm -hmm. and uh, this idea of representation is really interesting too because. Design-wise, when you're designing a game, it's a lot easier to have standard outfits, um, so familiar outfits, and then it's a lot easier to, des to design non-player characters that um, look a certain way and fit into this idea already. But then that changes the implications of the story overall. So yeah, when you respond to Leonard about outfits, I wonder if you can tie in something about portrayals generally. Um, yeah, I don't have much to say about outfits other than um, Part of the discourse around this game was the outcry for more outfits um, from specific comic book panels, <laughs> even <laughs> not even specific eras, um, but but very specific outfits. Um, and uh, there's so there's something about this game that makes players want to, to, to play dress up. Um, there's there's something about this game and the way that it has done collectibles and um, that is, is uh, very successful and the only place that I've thought about outfits is in relation to that, uh, to be honest. Um, I think that representationally the more interesting questions um, are um, about the way that, that race and gender are portrayed in this. Um, I mean, identity is a, identity and identification is a question that um, you would have to interrogate 12 different people in order to get 12 different logics behind processes of identification. So rather than you know making some sort of generalization up here um, about that, I can make a generalization about the, the visual representation that actually that actually occurred in the game. Um, and, uh, and I think that we can pretty flatly say that it's pretty terrible. Um, you know, the, the one prominent Asian character that Leonard mentions uh, becomes the villain. Um, he starts as a philanthropist, uh, social welfare sort of uh, social worker, actually. Uh, a philanthropist, social worker, and uh, by the end of the game, he's a mystical demon man. Mm -hmm. Go figure how the only Asian character <laughs> somehow became a mystical demon man. Um, in, in this game, uh, there's one disabled character. Uh, that disabled character views disability as worse than committing genocide. He'd rather commit genocide than be disabled. I don't know how much more terrible of a representation of a disabled person you could get. Um, uh, in terms of gender, there absolutely is the problem of um, <clears throat> there absolutely is the problem of the uh, the hench, the thugs, all being henchmen uh, as opposed to hench persons. <laughs> but it kind of just flows off the tongue. Um, but but um, you know, couple that with the fact that um, there's also procedural representation going on. So, for instance, with MJ and with Milo. Uh, Miles Morales, sorry, Milo. Uh, <laughs> you're able to play uh, for some short sequences as either MJ or, or Miles, um, and those are stealth. 
right? The rest of this game, there's no stealth element, <laughs> right? No, the, well, stealth challenges. Well, yes, there are stealth challenges, mm -hmm. and and stealthing up before starting an attack mm -hmm. is is usually a good idea, right? But but other than those challenges, there are no specific stealth missions. Is and, that correct? Well, and to be fair, that, the yeah. stealth that happens is stealth with an attack, whereas sure. the stealth with Miles and MJ are you you're completely. Um, avoiding the attack, yeah. and I, th I actually want you to comment on that one sequence where MJ's in the museum, and then Spidey does all the killing for her. Right. Like you can right. send Spidey in to do the the kill, <laughs> right. but she doesn't do it herself. So that's a bit weird, right? right. Like here's a woman, strong woman, by sure. the way. Throughout the story, there there are quips in there where she says, you know, like uh, I don't know, like there there are definitely she's got some lines where it, it makes it very clear right. that she's wearing the pants in that relationship. Yet she has to call in Spider-Man from the interactive perspective yeah. to do the dirty work for her. That's a bit weird. Right. No? Yeah. Well, so that's the, I mean that's the procedural rhetoric, right? That's where the the, the representation and the mechanics come into play, like in in, in a significant way. Um, and in the case of Miles and MJ, right, the 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 feminized and the racialized figures. Miles um, is a black character. Miles, I don't know yeah, Miles Morales, uh, uh, alternate universe Spider-Man, but also uh, an African American boy. Um, and yeah, so uh, Miles and MJ, the feminized, the racialized characters, uh, they don't have the same power and agency, right, as Spider-Man does. Um, and um, um, yeah, they're uh, they're sequences of gameplay are characterized um, not by the effect of, hell yeah, I'm going to beat some more people up, <laughs> but rather by, uh, can I get out of this alive? Can I sneak through this? Right? Uh, so it's a very different sensibility, right? It's a very different uh, cognitive state uh, to, to ask the player to be in um, that, that I think um, when you put that together with the procedural mapping of, of power, um, and the visual representation, the visual mapping um, of those different roles, then, then I think you have a formula for um, um, normalizing a, some fairly, well, continuing to normalize some fairly harmful beliefs that are already for, fairly normalized in North American society. So, Leonard, um, how would you, in your research, practice go about like studying what the impact of this might be on a player? Yeah, so we, uh, I think in general, um, if we were interested in, in studying such a research question, uh, we would then systematically uh, try to do a, a user impact study. So we would look at um, first the impact of the interaction mechanics. Uh, so what Gerald already pointed to is that there's less agency when playing certain characters. And um, we would, you could tie the research question in the back end towards um, whether that um, change in agency A is perceived and how it's perceived. And then of course, because the agency is tied to the, the gender or the visual representation of that character, um, you would then, in your uh, discussion section or in the interviews that you would conduct in the users afterwards, you would try and find uh, out whether or not um, the people are actually perceiving that kind of um, problem that, or mm. you can't label it a problem. Again, as a scientist, you gotta be open to, is it a problem, is it not a problem? Like, how, how does it perceive it, right? So you would, uh, you would do a study where you're playing a sequence, ideally you would systematically um, build exactly the same level. One time you'd play through it as Spider-Man, one time you would play through it as MJ with the help of Spider-Man or something like that, where you have these assists. So you could essentially do the same challenges, could, could be completely the same level, but one is you don't actually have the power and one is where you actually have the power to, to knock out the enemies and fight them and all that stuff. And then you could just do a, that would actually be a hot study to just kind of do that comparison and see, um, now I want to do this, this is annoying, like this yeah. always happens, yeah. you, you do a panel <laughs> and then you're like, why am I not doing this research? Um, anyways, uh, so you would kind of look at, okay, so what's the difference here in, in terms of uh, freedom of interaction and um, what are the larger implications that happen just because the developers chose to represent it in a certain way, right? Because they could have also just said, you know, like this is Spidey's little brother or what, you know, yet another white male that has physical abilities and, and whatnot. And, um, then you, 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 you don't have any sort of biasing in terms of the character, right? But they, they deliberately chose not to, and you know, whether, where that's all coming from, uh, who knows, and you know, what, what drives it. But in terms of impact of the player, yeah. it would be interesting to find out what the actual impact of the player is and whether there is any. Again, as a scientist, you always have to ask, is there an impact at all? Is this something, I mean, Gerald's, Gerald would be the one that would deliver the material for me to have an hypothesis about this, mm. but then we would study 
and see does that hypothesis hold true. And of course, depending on the sample selection, right? Like we would uh, again have to select a sample where we don't only study uh, middle-aged white dudes, uh, not just uh, do a generalization, but yeah. ob obviously study a diverse po population of people mm -hmm. that would be engaging with that game and then see what the impact on that diverse population of people would be. Yeah. And to, to pick up on the same thing, um, to pick up on the same thing, I, um, I have uh, made that argument in my theory and criticism. I've made the argument that in games like The Last of Us, and uh, uh, I guess it would apply to, the same logic would apply to God of War. Um, uh, well, actually not, because you don't actually play as Atreus. Um, but, uh, but I made the argument in Last of Us, at least, that when you switch between these helper characters and the primary character, that there is a different affective positioning of the player in relationship to their understanding of the game world, their understanding of other actors, their understanding of, of um, their own relationship to those characters through that switching, um, but that is purely theoretical, right? <laughs> and, and informed by um, um, certain elements of screen theory and rhetorical theory, um, but untested, right? In in the way that um, somebody like research, somebody like Dr. Not like Leonard here um, could, right? Um, could do that testing. Um, I would still be curious, um, you know. Uh, in that situation, how you would deal with um, um, the lack of perception, right, of that distinction. Um, because <clears throat> um, um, it's the very lack of, per of, of, of people noticing that um, in the online forums where they discuss these games, right? Um, it's the very lack of people talking about the significance of that switch um, and the way that it makes them feel, et cetera, um, that made me want to write about it in the first place, right? So I worry that players, users wouldn't perceive that in the first place. And so um, while on the one hand, I see your sort of research as the way to, um, to really ground, right, these hypotheses, um, to really ground this theory um, in certain other ways, I wonder, um, you know, how how you might deal with something like that. I think you're actually onto something there. I think what would be actually exciting is to look at the differences between um, what you first said, uh, games like Uncharted, where you play the same character but the younger version, right? Like, how does that help us understand the character that we're actually playing? Because we're just playing different versions of that character, a more vulnerable version of that character, versus games like The Last of Us, where we're playing the helper characters, um, or like uh, Spider-Man, where again, where you're playing a helper character, you're not actually playing the same character. Uh, so that actually be a really interesting, uh, I think, area of study. Um, hello, grad students, if there's anyone uh, down for this kind of thesis research. Um, but the, wouldn't that be good to understand um, what, in, in terms of, you know, narrative uh, perception here and perception of uh, game mechanics, does it, does the change, because it's always a change of mechanics, it's always a change of interactive freedom that happens in that switch. How does that uh, change of interaction mechanics under, uh, undermine or influence our perception of the character, our perception of the story, our perception, again, the story being the driver of the overall experience. And right. that's, of course, what I'm very interested in. Like, how does that kind of switch um, enrich or not enrich our experience? Okay. Um, what, what does it do to our perception of the game? And maybe even, and so uh, just to quote, like one of the uh, important researchers in our feed, Mark Hassensal, uh, who did some research on the overall experience. And I think Don Norman would agree with, with me on that. And some of the uh, big research in our fields, they, they always say, you know, like when you call yourself an experience designer and then you, you do the website or you do the game and that's your experience design, it's not. It's really the, like everything. And I think Don Norman was one of the first that argued for, it's really everything from the moment you unpack and you know there's this a reason why we have these unpacking videos on YouTube now like the experience begins in the moment that you engage with a thing and you know this is beyond this is beyond games and this is beyond products right now this has made its way into movies because at movies we're now looking at universes why do you think we have movie universes because people are engaging with an overall experience what does a universe do in terms of narrative for you as the audience, it changes your perception of the overall experience. It ties into a much larger experience, not just the singular experience of watching the movie, but it is that larger reference frame that you now have. And it's the same 
uh, with games and with franchises, right? It, it, that bigger understanding, I think there's something to be said about that. Like how, you know, how does a, an experience work on different levels? And uh, I think this is a very good example of interaction levels. Like how do different levels of interaction influence, strengthen, or lessen our experience of that game? Does it make uh, some of those things more memorable? I personally really enjoyed those MJ moments, but I always felt it kind of lame because it reminded me of my first God of War experience on the PlayStation 2, where I always felt like I'm in a tunnel, you know? Like, God of War, like, I'm the kind of gamer that needs to jump into the lava. Like, any game, if there's <laughs> lava, I'm jumping into it. I gotta have that experience. And God of War, like many PlayStation games back in the day, and this is, I think, a limitation of the technology at the time, is basically you're in a tunnel, just an invisible tunnel, but you're jumping through a tunnel and that tunnel is fixed through cameras and everything, but there is no way to jump out of that tunnel. And once I found that out, and God of War was one of the first games where I had that aha moment where I'm like, man, I'm just in a tunnel, this is lame. And um, you, you didn't have that freedom. Now, Spider-Man, definitely not a tunnel, definitely freedom of movement. I'm making a segue here into interaction mechanics. That, yeah. um, <laughs> so smooth. I smell what you're um, so Spider-Man doesn't, doesn't have that, and that's kind of exciting with um, just, just the way, I think we both have read uh, some reviews of Spider-Man and just kind of this idea of why, do, why, our initial question, why do people love it that much? Like, you, you know, obviously we're drawn to this game because everyone loves it so much. And I think uh, one of the big things is that, that freedom of interaction and that liveliness, and of course also the liveliness of choice. And behind me, you can see some of the, the benchmarks that you have. Like, um, there is no lack of goals that you can set for yourself. Like, these are just some of the little achievements that you can do that you can set for yourself, such as running alongside a building or jumping a lot or, or things like that. But there's also, in terms of goals, you can, you can collect little cats and get a little nice uh, uh, cat, not cat, one black cat, um, uh, black cat experience narratively. You can collect all the backpacks, which we have a story anecdote about that, how hard it was to find one of those backpacks, an absolute nightmare. Um, <laughs> but there are so many things, so many goals you can set for yourself. And that, that ability to make all these decisions, and I have a PhD student actually studying decision making, so that game should actually be on your list of things to play, um, is uh, I think that's kind of what makes that so exciting. You have a lot of different decisions that you can make in that game that, that allow you to enjoy it. But on top of that, you also have that massive, visceral transition through New York City that is just so exciting. And this is where I pass over the microphone, so I stop talking and just yeah. don't keep going. I got really excited about freedom of movement here. <laughs> I, think, I think visceral is a good, good word for it. I mean, it's, it's the sort of swinging through New York um, as Spider-Man is sort of like doing the eagle jump all the time in Assassin's Creed. It, mm -hmm. it is a first person roller coaster ride um, where you actually feel like you are moving through space. Um, you, it, it, there's something tricking our prio perception uh, to make our bodies feel like they are moving more than they actually are. Uh, and I'm, I'm uh, fascinated by that, but um, that's totally outside of my wheelhouse. Um, um, but yeah, there's something very appealing about that. Um, and um, I, I think when Leonard and I were first talking about this, I described it as there's this absolute freedom of movement, um, and and I couldn't get that phrase out of my head, and so I had to, I like typed it into, I'm sure I stole this from somebody, I typed it into Google. Uh, I didn't steal it from somebody, rather the phrase is complete freedom of movement, <laughs> which I stole from Henry Jenkins, uh, who was writing about um, uh, in an essay in Barbie, uh, Beyond Barbie and Mortal Kombat, um, the original uh, anthology looking at gender in video games. Um, he was writing about how boy play culture is often characterized by absolute, complete freedom of movement, um, complete freedom to navigate, to explore, uh, and to master spaces. Um, and that on the contrary, girls' culture, at least in the time where he was writing, was about containment <laughs> um, and about um, um, specifically making girls aware that spaces were not safe to move around in, actually. Um, and, um, and, and yeah, so I, I, I couldn't help but be struck by the fact that this descriptor just stuck so well, uh, and you, you, you said that it sounded like a good descriptor as well, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and yet here is, here it is in another context, 
uh, the descriptor for a perfectly asymmetrical gender system of gender inequality, right? Um, and um, and and I don't have thoughts that are further developed on it than that. But but I wonder, you know, to what extent um, is Spider Man um, transcending right that the set of appeals that we associate with a masculine gameplay, but but B with a sort of mastery, exploration, domination of space that that is part of that absolute freedom of movement. So would you make an argument that it's more appealing to boys? I, I would make, well, I'm not sure what I would argue, but the literature would seem to suggest that, that it is, right, that the gameplay is organized around activities and values that have been traditionally, right, associated, associated with boys and masculine cultures, yeah. See, I find that interesting, not so much on the, on the gender perspective, but uh, one of the things that we would study um, with this type of game uh, would, of course, be all the different um, personality traits that the game caters to. And we, we've had, you know, in the past, we've tried to classify, um, well, we, we went from having different types of personalities that we looked into into more personality traits and ways that you would engage with the game and not just the game but gamification in general like what types of um, design elements we, you would you know kind of favor um, in, in terms of your gameplay preferences and what I find quite interesting is the mix that the game provides because it does give you um, a, a lot of these um, I would say more exploration uh, you say dominance of space but I, I would say there's a lot of exploration even collection uh, at stake there and that's quite prominent and, and me I'm actually that kind of player. I, um, Gerald said he went back for the backpacks uh, quite late in the game. I actually, that was one of the first things I went about because I'm like, yeah, I get to collect backpacks. I'm weird like that. Um, I love so, that. I thought that was Right? Yeah. That was awesome. Um, and so, you know, you go about collect those, I actually like the cats more than the backpacks, partially because you had to do a little photo and give you that little vibration when you're just like, oh, I'm about to see a cat. Okay, let's zoom in. Cute um, pictures. Absolutely cute. Cute, 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 cat cute cats. And so uh, another thing that I really liked was in-flight shooting. Uh, so uh, my students and me were, were all a little bit kind of into uh, uh, photos and videos uh, here and kind of like that stuff. And so uh, Spider-Man, as everyone knows, Peter Parker is a photographer. Um, and so Spider-Man oh, takes... Like shooting. Yeah, shooting oh, okay. as in photos, not shooting with a gun. <laughs> Obvi. Um, <laughs> Spider nobody likes yeah. shooting. <laughs> Spider-Man, he doesn't shoot. Uh, other than pew, pew, the, the web shooters. Anyways. Um, so... One of the things that I liked was actually like exploring and uncovering all of these uh, sites because that's another thing. The landmark challenge, I think landmarks was actually one of the first things that I completed as a challenge. Then I go went for the backpacks, but uh, that was awesome. You know, like you swing all the way up to a high building, Avengers Tower or Stark Tower, or whatever it's called, and then you just fall down. And while you're falling down, because as you go into that mode, when you go into photo mode, time slows down a little bit. So I'm very fiddly with the joystick. I actually need that. That's probably they probably user tested it with people like me that actually can't do things in real time. Mm -hmm. So like we better slow down this time so Leonard can actually play this. <laughs> and so that, what happens is you slow down the time. And you have some time to fiddle around and actually. And it, it, the the feedback in that moment is actually really nice from a UI perspective. You know, it turns green. It says subject in frame. Gosh, okay, I got a subject in frame. I can shoot now, and that means shoot the photo, and and then take that with you. So. Um, it actually even has, uh, I don't have that video with me, but I, I don't know if you found that, it has a shooting mode. You can go into camera mode hmm. only, yep. only to take pictures and like put filters. You got a whole Instagram going you there. You want to talk about the problems of the UI? I found myself in the photography mode unexpectedly a number of times. <laughs> <laughs> unexpectedly? That yeah. was always intentional. For me. <laughs> well, okay. But actually, so, no, I, yes, I know where you're coming from. The UI. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There, <laughs> there was, there, there, there's some finicky stuff. If we want to talk about problems in the UI, we can also talk about that backpack thing. That that actually drove me crazy. So on the backpack challenge, there is one backpack all the way up north under a bridge somewhere. And the, so um, it's on what, the coast. It's on the coast. Uh, yeah, it's on a sort of, in a tunnel-ish. Um, and so when you press the right stick, you essentially um, you get the extra help. So what happens is, um, so a lot of my uh, friends, some former students, are games user researchers, and and uh, we always have this discussion at the Games User Research Summit about like players not doing stuff. And if if you've ever designed a game yourself and you watch people play, you're like, how are people not getting this? And and so one of the things is players never look up. If you ever played a first-person shooter, you gotta like point like three, four, five, six, seven arrows up there. You gotta look up. 
up. You got to look up. That's where you have to look because people just won't get it. They won't look up. And first person shooters all like look and say, what? Up? Okay. So like something dangerous got to happen in front of you to look up in first person shooters. And the same, you know, like with Spider-Man, probably like, okay, so they have the marker already on the map. Let's have a look at, uh, because we can um, probably see that in one of the videos here where we can say, okay, there's a map marker. My finger is too thick to do this. Um, uh, oh yeah, here, here we go. Here's a map. Whoops. That's the skill tree, um, but there's going to be a map in a second. I'm going to switch over to the map. And so, um, yeah, skill tree was pretty nice, too, and, and that whole system. I really didn't like the skill tree. You so really didn't you like You can explain what that means after. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll explain that in a, in a second. Um, these are the gadgets, benchmarks, characters. Um, oh, come on, go to map. Is this a game about fighting crime, or is it a game about managing an inventory? Yeah. yeah uh, so, so for me, like managing an inventory is definitely one of the things I like about games. Uh, so the, the crime was actually that was a little bit of annoyance. But um, okay. So uh, what you see in the map here, as as I zoom around, you see those big fat markers, right? Like I just put a marker on the backpack because obviously I'm collecting backpacks. And then there's the actual story, which is in yellow. As you can see, that thing lights actually up. And in the back there, the green one, that's another backpack, right? So you can see it has that little marker that goes all the way up on top just so that you're why I, uh, why did that i don't know I, this is one of the things where i just got stuck talk about usability and then add crime okay let's just solve the crime instead you know i was on the way to get a backpack but my spidey senses tingled and there was a crime okay let's solve that crime all right let's do that um but actually i wanted to get the backpack anyways that and and I was actually talking about user interface, and now I got like completely, see, ADD. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about um, the game at all times is very good. As you see here, it shows you the button combinations. You got L and L1 and R1 if you want to throw stuff. Like, it shows you the moment something is available, the game shows you this is what you got to do. That's good game usability. That's what we do in games user research. And, and that's weird if you think about it. Like you got to be that explicit to people because we're that dumb when we're playing games. We don't want to actually like recognize, uh, we want to recognize, but we don't want to recall that information about what the interactive elements are. We need to be able to just recognize it instead of recalling it. So that makes part of the fun. Okay, part of the, oh man, I had almost no items back then. Um, part of the fun of that research. But then with the UI element in terms of the, the backpacks, one of the problems was is you, you, you would see where you're going, but when you get there, again, because it's just a, a stream in the, in the, in the sky, um, that stupid one backpack was underneath the bridge. So I would see it's somewhere here, but I was actually on, so it doesn't do 3D well. Mm -hmm. And again, one of those problems, you don't look up in first person shooters. I didn't think that there was actually something underneath the park uh, where I was, which was a tunnel underneath the park. But again, not been to New York that much. Um, but Gerald later told me, like, they actually wanted you to go into that tunnel mm -hmm. because later there's actually a fight sequence in that tunnel to find that tunnel. So that was interesting. Maybe you can pick up now because I've been... Yeah. So, yeah, I, I played the game wrong because <laughs> uh, it, at least theoretically, if, if that backpack had a purpose, it was to train you for a story-mandated fight an ambush of a prison transport that takes place in that tunnel that requires you to move from the lower level back and forth between the lower and upper level. Um, but me personally, I collected that back pass maybe the second or third to last. Mm -hmm. um, so it also made sense though in that regard because I felt like, okay, I found most of the backpacks, no problem. What is up with this one? Ah, oh, it's challenging now. <laughs> like all I had to do was look down. <laughs> but um, but yeah, it was it was uh, it it didn't feel weird because it came in that sequence, just given the way that I'd played. But um, but 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 even if you think about it, like if this was intentional, if it was intentionally training players to hey parts of the city are double layered, you're going to need to be aware of that. Um, um, did it do a good job of that? I don't, I don't know. I, I, don't I know. think because, because it wasn't gated, because you could do the training after the sequence, mm -hmm. that no. But 
Well, they did a really good job of highlighting and, and ex explaining where most of these things were. So from a user research perspective, this actually looks like a game that had some really good research done on it. And I'm actually not sure if that's the case. Um, but the interesting perspective uh, for me was like how it made you think in that moment. Mm -hmm. And you actually like really had to think, okay, they're usually in weird locations. They're usually stuck somewhere on the ceiling or somewhere. So they're usually, they're not in the bush in front of me because there was a little bush. I was like, it's hidden in that bush. And I just kept going back and forth through that bush and there was nothing in the bush. And so instead I was like, okay, it is probably somewhere else uh, because it also has that, gets the little highlight on the top. And I couldn't see any of that. So I'm like, OK, think about it. It's, it's got to be on a more challenging location. And that's when I started looking down. That's when I started mm -hmm. finding the tunnel and actually, uh, and actually going for it. Um, but I wish I had that video. That's a fun 10 minutes to watch me just go back and forth through the bush and just like, what is going on? You think Spidey is having some sort of heart attack there. So what you said there um, about the game's user research perspective, that they did this successfully. Cause, so I want to ask about this. When I was playing, um, there was this one combat sequence really early on that I got completely stuck with because um, you're supposed to, I figured this out later, you're supposed to do the L1, R1 keys mm. that they send you mm -hmm. in order to get multiple of the enemies down at once. And I just, every time they prompted me with this, I ignored them. Yeah. And I kept melee attacking. Mm. Um, instead of you know using web attacks and all of the clues that they were giving me, I just missed mm. them. You just didn't read. Yeah, well. Mm -hmm. Standard so, player. So you. That's why we have those clues later in the game at all times. Because mm. a lot of people are like you. They're exactly playing the same way. People don't read. People don't listen to tutorials. Yeah. They just want to get shit done. We don't have time to read the, the clue. Because there was like a line of text, right? Yeah, I didn't, didn't read that. Yeah. yeah, same with me. And when that first. Uh, but I, I, I remember exactly that sequence that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. And I had to play it three or four times. I'm like, what does the game want me to do right now? Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay. Calm down, read the text. Oh, that's what I'm doing. And then you have that moment where you feel like a dumb player. But like most yeah. players, go exactly about like like that. So, mm -hmm. so there's some there's some debate about this uh, uh, going on in the the video games discourse right now about whether or not games should have tutorials and about whether or not um, people pay attention to them and what kinds of people pay attention to them and what kinds of people want tutorials. Um, and uh, in that discourse, the argument goes that um, increasingly there is a call from game culture, um, <coughs> scare quotes, to reduce the amount of tutorials because we don't pay attention to them, because we don't need them, because the controls, if they're not intuitive anyway, then, well, they better be pretty easy to, to adapt from the other <coughs> FPS to the other first person shooter to this one right here, right? Um, but the pushback against that, right, is that uh, it, it makes it harder for new players to get into this space. Those mm -hmm. players who aren't familiar with those conditions um, uh, and, and traditional means of interaction. And so um, I, I can't help but wonder if this is really an instance of bad uh, user experience, use UX mm -hmm. design, or if it's a matter of our cultural knowledge sort of getting in the way of our ability to appreciate UX design. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, it's just you now a thought, a hypothesis, but. Um, well, it's really, uh, again, there is this uh, core idea in, in game design that games are about learning. And part mm. of the fun of games is that you like acquiring new skills, right? Like, we like learning, but then the, the trick in good game design is, of course, what is the threshold, right? Like, what is a good threshold for us to, to learn a mechanic? And how often, should, and how, how is that actually done, that teaching? Is it done in an explicit way? And, and if, for, for players like you that have experienced that stuff, uh, a very good way of uh, finding an um, uh, ironic uh, frame of self-reference would be to play Far Cry Blood Dragon. Um, I actually know some of the people on the Far Cry user research team. And it's funny because that tutorial is the tutorial that makes fun of tutorials. Uh, it is absolutely self-referential, and it's just the first five or ten minutes of the game where the, the Far Cry dude is just like, well, this is where you press the button. Just, no, did you press the button? This is the button that you should be pressing, kind of like that. So it's, it's a very, you know, it's, it's, it's very tongue-in-cheek, kind of how it gives you that tutorial. Um, 
because you, sh you should already know that or yeah you might appreciate it differently like new players mm -hmm. might appreciate more and, and uh, experienced players might appreciate it less i think the reason why that worked is because um with the far cry games we always see that do the real game then do the mod of the game blood dragon was a mod of far cry 3 i think it was and the new one is new dawn or whatever is so the mod of far cry 5 uh so it's it's like the same universe universe the same assets just like new new textures new shaders or whatever and just kind of um getting getting a bit, bit more bang for the buck there um but in um yeah in, in that world uh i think that actually brings us as a nice segue uh to some of the references that the game does because i think this game and far cry there's actually a lot of references that both gerald and i saw sure. part of the mechanics as well uh because i think for, and again far cry might not have been the first one uh I'm, it might have just been the the one where i first experienced that but this whole mechanic that you go through an open world and then you have camps of goons that you have to eliminate that's something that ever since far cry 3 that has been pretty uh, pretty common mechanic strongholds uh, so strongholds that kind of stuff um and that's of course the case in spider-man 2 you know you you have these uh and you actually get points you get those what is it gang points no like uh you, you get some sort of tokens you get a special token for uh, going through this camp. I think it's a gang token or camp token or something like that. Um, so it, it's quite interesting that the game makes use of uh, that type me uh, of mechanic quite a bit. And uh, to me, it felt like, okay, this game is actually referencing uh, Far Cry in that. There's also, uh, do you think that as well, while I pull up the other uh, video? So yeah, I, d I, I do think that it is absolutely drawing uh, from the same uh, patterns as as Far Cry is drawing from, um, and and I think that uh, beyond the camp uh, thing, uh, you know, there's uh, we also mentioned that there were um, in Spider Man, it's the sequences with Lee, right, mm -hmm. where Spider Man is trying to convince him to stop being a mystical, supernatural bad guy and yeah. start being Mr. Lee again, um, that where Peter Parker as Spider-Man is chasing Lee through these islands in the mist um, and jumping and slinging from one to the other, uh, that was very reminiscent of a lot of the dope scenes, the drug scenes from Far Cry, where in every, I haven't played the first two, but in three, four, and five, at some point you are put under the influence of a drug, voluntarily or involuntarily, <laughs> uh, and you have to right make your way through this hazy, distorted landscape that is, um, yeah, similar to to this one. Although this yeah. isn't this the scene I was thinking of. The ones I was thinking of are the ones where yeah, it's happening okay. in a second. He's yeah, getting sure. into that scene. Uh, this happens when you you get poison from scorpion. Uh, oh, this is also interesting because um, I used to hate that these types of mini games. And they're actually kind of uh, so Far Cry, uh, not Far Cry. Um, Spider-Man has two types of mini games. One is this DNA pattern matching game uh, to do DNA analysis, and they actually have quite a few, and you get like lab points for doing those. Mm -hmm. And then they have uh, sort of this pipe game um, where you have to Connect do electricity. But yep. that, that's kind of that's one of the oldest games out there. Like the the yeah. it used to be a pipe, and it used to be like water flowing from one area in the other. And they just added that as a mini game in here. Mind you, they added electrical voltages and a little bit of math on top of that. Mm. Um, but they also had these these DNA matching games that you have to do. So you have these mini games, and that's actually interesting because I think that again was a reference to some uh, Skyrim, the first where you had the lock picking mini games and other things mm. like that, where you also had um, mini games uh, that were part of the game. And this, yeah. I, I think this um, uh, again, this was quite interesting the way it was done in here. But I think, let's just find that sequence real quick. This is kind of where it See, starts. I think, OK. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. This is a very cool suit. Uh, that is one of the, the later suits. But I thought, that man, that was a cool suit. He doesn't look like Spider-Man at all. He looks like Iron Man. Um, sorry for all the comic geeks. Um, but that's what happens, essentially. You know, he's got the poison. And then all of a sudden, he ends up in this dream world. And anyone that has played um, Dishonored has, could probably find a frame of reference here because Dishonored has a moment like that. Plus, we, f we find many games where all of a sudden the space is completely dissolved, so it destroys space, and um, now you're um, yeah in this in this weird dream world. And you go yeah. into the dream sequence. Yeah, and and um, so yeah, the Far Cry was another example in terms of this weird dreamlike, everything is slow and a little hazy sort of yeah. 
thing that they do, um, but um, uh, there's, I'm forgetting which one, but uh, there's, uh, there's also a sequence in, in Elder Scrolls. Um, I think it might have been the Shimmering Isles one, um, where you deal with that insane god-like character. Um, and um, so this is, you know, this is not an uncommon sort of sequence. Um, I'm, for, for me, it, uh, unfortunately, I haven't thought about it enough to, to suggest what it what might mean, aside from uh, broader things that we could say about what it might mean for the genre uh, uh, and for the way that it constructs an audience, right? Um, in that uh, game designers are going to reuse these established patterns because they know that certain people associate themselves as the audience for the games that could contain and reproduce those patterns of activity. Um, and so um, picking up those elements from tentpole FPS franchises, tentpole RPG franchises, um, right, doesn't reproduce the feel of those genres or those franchises, but it does bring in elements from them that will feel familiar to those players who maybe aren't super familiar with the beat-em-up, uh, which Spider-Man feels a lot like to me. Um, and uh, so, you know, maybe uh, in terms of thinking about how different groups of players might experience that and, and different groups of players might have more or less affinity for those types of patterns as they recur in other types of games. I think it's quite interesting because it actually ties together the three aspects of our panel today where we have something that is uh, basically a design uh, inspiration from a, a different game. So you're redesigning a moment that you've already experienced in a different game. But you're doing that because obviously at some point somebody, uh, th there was good criticism about that exper experience. So people did enjoy that experience, whatever it was, whether it was for the narrative or not. But it leads to, and this is a citation both of a narrative and a gameplay moment here. So we have that sort of quotation. So the question is, at what point does something like that, a quotation, become, if we use uh, sort of narrative theory, or a, I'm completely talking out of my butt here because I've never studied that, but I'm thinking this is like an idiom, essentially. If, if you would see game design as a language, this is the forming of an idiom. So are you, f are you forming these patterns, these idioms, that actually help us speak game design? So given that, you know, in industry often, uh, in the talks at GDC, oftentimes people talk about we don't really have a language. There was Craig Christikian's early article about, you know, we, we have no words, um, words, but we must design. And so now we have, actually, we're starting to have a lot of words. We're starting to have a lot of grammar. Ralph, Ralph Koster uh, made, did a talk on the, the grammar of game design. And so I think that's interesting, seeing games quote each other. And the more, um, you know, one game quotes another, another, the more likely it is to become a pattern or to become an idiom or to become a, a word or a, 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 some uh, element of meaning within the larger design space. And um, for those of us that play games and experience these things, that's quite interesting how we pick that up over time. And uh, how we, uh, for me, that's always a truly enjoyable moment when I have that frame of reference. And I think you could maybe, maybe that's akin to watching Solo. I don't know if anyone's watched the Star Wars movie Solo, but that's a movie that entirely lives off of those moments. That, that movie has no story at all. It has just references. That entire movie is just references to Star Wars moments. And the reason why people enjoy that movie is because, sorry, Totally dissing Solo here. It was a good movie though. Explanations uh, for other Star Wars, not references. Well, explanations. They're really for other they're Star recreating Wars moments all the time. Mm -hmm. It's like here you have that typical. Like it is like honestly, it is just the the same typical Star Wars moment over and over again. And it was good. Like I'm a sucker for that. I like Star Wars. No problem. I like you Solo. If anyone has problems with that. I liked yeah. it. It was a good movie. It's just <laughs> a lot of a lot of referencing. So right. if somebody made a game that was entirely referencing other games, I think I'd enjoy that. So I'd have a good time. I have a question here um, about player experience of this because to me, this is a violation of my expectations for Spider-Man because they establish um, that it's going to be a lot of realism and you're going to be going through New York and all that, and then all of a sudden you get this sequence that's a dream sequence. So if this were to happen in a movie, if you sat down and you're watching a nonfiction, and then all of a sudden they sh show you something fictional, which is a little bit maybe more of a dramatic example, but um, if they violate your expectations hours into knowing what's happening in the game, how does that change the player experience? 
wait a second, I would like to ask if there's a media study scholar in the audience that can point to, there's this thing that the, uh, that, that you can do in movies where the main actions happens off screen, off of the camera. And there was this, this Western movie with the, the guy that, that shot people with that, that uh, gun for, for cows. What was that called? The Coen Brothers movie? No Country for Old Men. Main point, not to spoil that movie, but somebody dies, important, and that killing of, it wasn't the main character, maybe it was the main character, I, no, no, no spoilers. Um, but that happens completely off screen. And then the movie just keeps going, boom. That messes with my expectations. So there is, there, there is there's something in narrative that's already being done in film that maybe games are trying to do here as well, the, disrupting the status quo of the film. And it's particularly flow. interesting for how it translates to games, because it wouldn't be a direct translation from media studies. Instead, we have procedural rhetoric to think about. Um, the rhetorical modes in games mean that it, it, it could potentially have a much bigger impact and be more of a violation, since it's first person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, potentially. It's, it's all about how people make meaning out of it. But I think that um, uh, what we could say with some certainty, rather than potentiality, is that, you know, when these things do cohere and, and when we are able to recognize the patterns from them, then two things are happening. One, we're talking about having more stable audiences. Um, they're becoming coherent because the audience for them is becoming coherent and the developers in relation understand that that is happening. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, when those start to become coherent patterns, then we can start to talk about things like genres, uh, as opposed to intertextual borrowing from other games. Mm -hmm. We can start to talk about the crystallization of a new pattern, a new genre, uh, a new type. Um, and maybe that should be the next conversation. I think that actually sounds <laughs> like that would be another good panel to have to talk about how genres manifest. Wouldn't yeah. you want to talk about that? Like, how do we actually create genres in games? It's really, genre is just something that people liked, so a lot of designers did it again, and now we've got that as a genre because a lot of people just clustered good ideas together. We might need In to games, talk a little bit more about genre theory. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's something. I definitely have a different opinion than you. That's good. We should. We, uh, is it time for questions? Yes, sure. Neil. Is it time for that? Uh, yes. I'll bring you the mic. I don't want to interrupt this. This has been awesome. So. I don't nice. actually know what the time is. <laughs> Here. This looks somehow intimidating. And you should introduce yourself, too. Hi, I'm Neil <laughs> Randall. Oh, this is for the film. I'm Neil Randall, the uh, director of the Games Institute, and I uh, look primarily at narrative and games, narrative and media. Um, so a couple things. First of all, this, the, the, I don't know what it's called, where the action takes place off camera, but this suddenly brought to mind in a completely unrelated way that Watching Monty Python's Life of Brian, there are a couple of instances where a genre changes completely in the middle of the movie, and it's a brilliant moment. It's not quite like this, but it sort of is. So there's, there's. I'll, I'll look into what that's actually a study. I have a, actually a point to make, and then uh, a question to ask. Partly because I know what it's like to be an academic in a conference, because that's what you always do, right? So. First of all, this bit about the, the interface showing you what you should do next, whatever that action is, right? Um, in, the, in the early days of video gaming, which some of us remember, um, there was a lot of discussion going on about, from the purest angle, about whether or not you should actually guide the, the player at all. And, and, and that, that was the idea that you're supposed to learn the game, learn the system, learn the mechanics, learn the actual actions that have to take place. Of course, that kind of comes unglued when you realize some of these games last a long time and you can't remember. And that got bound up in the whole discussion about interfaces being about, as you mentioned, Leonard, the whole idea of recognition versus remembering. And that was the whole basis of the, 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 you know, the menu interviews, the face that happened with Macs and with Windows and all that. They were trying to, you don't actually have to type anything to remember it. You actually get to recognize it. So that big amount of that. But what's getting interesting is the discussion that we've always had reminders that were called rules. So rule books were reminder systems for what the options were, what the possibilities were. And then there was another really good point that got brought up in one, one uh, article I was reading. It wasn't an academic article, pointing that, and actually it was from a designer of some of the games. So why, the reason you do that is because it harkens back to the days when people would just stand behind you and point out what you could, should actually be doing in a game. So when you're playing an Atari game in the early days, 
People would be t- standing there saying, well, no, point, hit that button, hit that button, hit that button, hit that button. And all the way through the game, you were being guided by siblings or by friends and all of that. So that's, I just wanted to point that out. And the question I have is, this is one that, that, that Marisa hit, hit on right here when she was talking about this being kind of a violation of the Spider-Man universe. And this is an adaptation question. The adaptation question in a nutshell is, what things do we reject, if you will, because they don't fit the source? Of, 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 of the actual artwork that we're doing. So Spider-Man has had a source that started in 1962. And I wonder to what degree, and this is, might be one of the examples, but to what degree does it matter that you know anything about the Spider-Man universe as you're playing this game? Which is not to suggest that it should matter, but does that factor in at all? And I have a great big long story about playing Lord of the Rings online that I'm not gonna go into here. But uh, it's the same sort of question I always have about it's about the same about watching movies about Spider-Man, but the game is really interesting because of a different perspective completely. Are you can rock there again. Yeah, <laughs> back and forth. Thank you. I think that was a sufficient academic question that has several parts. Yeah, I, I wonder where to start now. It did have several parts. Uh-huh. Um, so uh, I, so for me personally, I, I don't think that. Um, no, it's it's too hard for me to say. I can't answer that question for myself. I was going to say I don't think it mattered that the story started in Meteor Res and that we didn't get an origin story, but yeah. I know the origin story of ba- or of Spider-Man, so that's that's not really a thing for me. Um, and and I don't and I don't feel comfortable generalizing my my knowledge slash experience to to how others might perceive it. But I am very interested in um, um, the fact that. Uh, you know, Spider-Man has, maybe this is a property of Spider-Man, the, the person, the costume crusader, uh, has sort of adapted as he has been updated. So one of the things that I thought was significant about this game that we didn't really get to talk about was the amount of intermedial storytelling, the amount of uh, storytelling through text messages and web crawler, the fake social media feed, right? Um, and uh, and that didn't feel out of place at all. In fact, it, it felt like, uh, at first it was like, oh, this is weird, kind of like a GTA thing going on. Uh, but then it was like, yeah, this is Spider-Man, he's bantering <laughs> and he's, he's trading jokes and witticisms and, and he's being Spider-Man just in a social space. Cool. Um, and it seemed to fit despite the dissonance that it was very new and uh, reminded me a little too much of GTA Five. <laughs> what, uh, the text, the, the social Twitter media uh, yeah. feed, social feed that yeah. he has there. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. I think um, what we're seeing in those moments. So I'm, I'm just trying to think. Would you, without the narrative, what Gerald said, without the narrative frame of reference, would you still have a great experience as somebody that studies experiences? I would actually hypothesize yes, because the experience is influenced by the mechanics and they are polished, very, very polished in this game. So the experience of swinging through New York City, whether or not I know why Spider-Man is swinging around, I don't need to know the why to be able to enjoy that uh, transitional mechanic. And um, I think sequences like that, where it might or might not break from the canon of Spider-Man comics and and, uh, 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 stories like that, I think that's where really the designers of the game can actually express themselves in the way that they want to, and they can make nods to, again, other genres, other games, other mechanics in a, in a way. And this happens pretty late in the game. This is about at 80 something uh, percent completion of the game. So this is not something that happens you know, to people that just pick up the game for the core feel. So this is not the core. This is sort of the deeper experience for, some, for the connoisseurs of us, so the people that um, you know, play a lot of games and, and, and want to enjoy these moments. So it's really catering, I, I would say, to a different fan base than somebody that's just in for a quick swing um, with Spider-Man 3 in New York City. So, but it is, um, yeah, I think it is interesting how they, they work. If you, if you think of it as a, a larger frame of media, like would this even work as a movie? If you think about it as an interactive movie, um, it probably would. It, it probably would still be a good story without knowing the origins of Spider-Man. There is enough of back and forth with MJ. You don't know at the start, not to spoil again, but you don't know at the start that MJ and Spidey had a little 
whippy whippy. Like there's like <laughs> they're out. like Peter, yeah, Peter Parker and MJ are not getting along. There was there's some <laughs> tension in that relationship, and and all you gotta know is there's a boyfriend and a girlfriend. They're having issues, so you're obviously you're rooting for them to get back together because then you know they're going to be good together. But they have issues to overcome, and, and that's engaging. That's an engaging hook into the story, I find. I did not root for them to get back together. I, I did totally. I was happy that MJ finally ditched him. Independence. <laughs> <laughs> like, sorry, but I don't. I'm not. I'm not a huge Spider-Man connoisseur, but I. I my perception is that MJ loves Spider-Man way too much for her own good. <laughs> and that is not the kind of uh, uh, relationship that I'd want for any female figure in my life uh, to put themselves on the line to be minimized by consistently by a dude in a costume. Mm. Well, um, you have the So I was then. not rooting for them yeah. to get back together in the end. I was a little disappointed, actually. Yeah. <laughs> Again, that's a realism dance where you see, you know, like if I think about it, it's, this dude is never home, swinging around, beating up bad <laughs> yes. guys. He doesn't actually put any work into this relationship. So, yeah, from a realism dance, man, like I wouldn't want to date Spider Man. That is a jerk. And but, he, you know, as in, you know, narrative framing and me identifying with some yeah. sort of superhero and there being this, this smart, intelligent girl, I guess that's a very gendered male stance that I'd be yeah. taking there. But, from that angle, it worked for me, but I, I get it. Like you but actually right. opened my eyes to that, to that side of it. But things. you're absolutely right that he's not a jerk like most heroes, right? He is. He's Spider-Man. He's a good person. He's he's you. He's friendly, <laughs> right? He's he's down to earth. He's he's your neighborhood Spider-Man. Um, and um, I, um, yeah, I I. I He's actually super insecure, like as shown in some of the scenes when sure, MJ doesn't sure. call him back and he like he's talking to himself while swinging yeah, through New yeah. York. He's such an insane like who wants to date that? But kind of ultimately, guy? but ultimately, <laughs> he he doesn't change. He no. is from the start to finish. He's a hero, right? There is that moment where you d you get to decide whether. Sorry, more spoilers. You get to decide whether Aunt May gets the antivirus or whether they replicate it so that everybody in the city can be cured and Aunt May dies in the meantime. You don't actually get to decide. It's a mm. false choice. Uh, the narrative decides for you. Spider-Man, there's never any question. There's no changing. There's no room. There's no reason for growth mm. um, because Spider-Man just is your all-American friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Mm. Um, so I'm going to get us to move on to the next question. Yeah, of course. Yep. But, uh, I just want to point out, this reminds me of the letters section of Spider-Man number 18. <laughs> <laughs> the same conversation you have. But go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. 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 Um, yeah, so we'll take some more questions from the audience. Did we get anything on Twitter? Did anyone check? Um, no, we won't be taking Twitter questions. Okay. Yeah. I, so I, I, I thought it was really interesting how you said that you thought that the your background of the I guess like the mythos of Spider-Man uh, didn't really affect your experience with with this with these particular later levels mm. that uh, that you even described as being like a betrayal of what your expect your expectations are from a Spider-Man game mm -hmm. and I think that's interesting because there is Spider-Man villains where it, where this kind of dreamlike se sequence mm. would actually make sense mm. if one had the the previous like you know near uh, you know the previous backstory of, okay. of, of certain of certain narratives from the yeah. comics to pretext it mm -hmm. so perhaps that kind of from that partic particular perspective maybe narrative does have a very distinctive influence on how the the user experiences the game yeah because and maybe that's something that could be tested. Yeah. But like, I don't know how you how you do that. Like, how would you maybe, by chance, uh, tackle that? I think it's a really interesting question because it points to the it points to a discongruity, right? Where in on the one hand, prior experience with the property with the franchise is. Um, um, unimportant right, to enjoying the overall arc of the story. Um, and by the way, one of the reasons I think that is that you don't need an origin story is because he doesn't change. Right? <laughs> there, there is no change, so you don't need to know the origin to know the end that he's going to. He's just the same the whole time. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you, I, I think that 
um, I'm comfortable saying that you don't need to, to uh, know the ins and outs of, of, of Spider-Man uh, in order to enjoy the, the arc of the story, but, uh, but it sounds like, uh, because I certainly didn't appreciate that sequence, I felt it was a betrayal. Uh, it's the same terms you use to describe it. Um, um, perhaps, yeah, if I had been primed, um, then, then I would have been more amenable to that. Uh, and it's an interesting, it'd be, I think it's an interesting, right, uh, parting of ways in the road to, to, to look at. Um, the extent to which that prior knowledge informs certain aspects of the play experience, but possibly not others. Um, I mean, that, that's akin to a lot of user experience models out there where context is a, uh, a very significant factor for uh, the experience. Um, I, I actually have a model that I, I published myself where we um, really um, measured how important contextual factors are. And of course, prior knowledge of a game, that's, uh, that's a contextual factor that taints or enhances your experience in any, uh, in any way. Um, that's the same as with um, you know, getting a spoiler before watching Sixth Sense. It's going to influence your experience of that movie. Um, uh, so there, there are definitely ways that prior knowledge can influence the, the way that we experience media. And um, so I, I would say there's, there's very likely, the hypothesis would be that there's very likely in, uh, some sort of influence on, on that experience, but. I want to um, add in here, because I think this is a great question, and I want to tease it out a bit more. Because um, this is something that is discussed a lot in adaptation studies, like how faithful the material needs to be to the source material, and whether or not it's a true adaptation. And that seems to be a point of contention in a lot of um, conversations about adaptations. Mm -hmm. So if we, if we kind of frame Spider-Man as an adaptation, and I know it's not a pure adaptation of Spider-Man, um, why wouldn't they change more? Like if they can change this mm -hmm. and violate that expectation, why wouldn't they change more and have you know, MJ engage in combat? Or you know, have Spider-Man get injured and then like more, more layers, more realism, um, more depth to the story. How would you study that? Would you study something like that, a violation of expectation and adaptation? Um, I'm currently not studying it, um, <laughs> but I mean, it's certainly interesting enough. Um, doesn't, you know, uh, as much kind of ring a bell as some of the other questions that have come up during today's panel, but because um, I think it's, it's really hard to tease out scientifically. It's really hard to tease out um, what is actually the influencing factor here. There's you know, a million ways that mm -hmm. uh, this could go. And um, It might be yeah. more of an industry, industry question, too, because it's a big risk for Insomniac Games to venture too far yeah. away from... Well, uh, yeah. my contribution was going to be that you know, there are genres of games that we have certain expectations about the... the style of gameplay and the tenor of the game, right? The mood and sensibility of the game. And then there are genres of stories and um, Spider-Man isn't a genre per se, but absolutely you could say that there are, there is a certain pattern of events that will happen in a Spider-Man story um, that are distinct from the way that those events would unfold in an Iron Man story or a Hulk story uh, because the person is different, situated in different circumstances. And so going farther away from one of those genres, either in terms of gameplay or in terms of what constitutes Spider-Man, um, is, is a risk. You know? uh, and you increase the risk uh, the further afield you go. As any kind of media, right? That's not just games. That's yeah. whenever you do an adaptation of something where people are, have already strong beliefs and there's a strong fan base, you yeah. risk alienating the fan base. Yeah. And genre theory would give you a way to point to a pattern that's being violated, right? Um, and and I imagine that some of the research that Lynn does would would point to the affects that that are right the experience that that occurs when those patterns are violated. Yeah. I think more interesting in that regard would be when you have a uh, n not about you know the narrative or the costumes or that stuff, but when you have a strong experience about or, or a strong feeling about the experience that a game should provide. So if you already have you know you've set uh, sort of a feeling for GTA, 
you're building the next GTA game and that doesn't reproduce that same feeling, then, then you, you have uh, sort of a problem. So this is why games usually grow slowly around core mechanics over time and they add little bits and pieces to it instead of changing the entire thing. So if something is a, uh, a very popular jump and run franchise, they're not going to change that, but they're, they're going to introduce little mechanics Part of the reason why Mario gets to wear different suits in his games is because that is a way to change little and tweak little bits of the mechanic, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's a jump and run game, but the new suits that come out with, with every time a new Super Mario Brothers game comes out um, in, allow a little bit of extra freedom along those lines and mm. you can experiment. I remember Mario before he could wear a raccoon suit and fly. I mean, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, but nowadays that's, that's just part of Mario, right? As well as... A, 20 other abilities that were gradually acquired over the years and mm -hmm. that fans of the series had things to say about. <laughs> um, and the things that they had less to say about stuck around. Yeah. Did anyone else have a question? Okay, so if we have uh, no audience questions, and if you do think of something, please feel free to raise your hand, because I'm gonna throw um, the closing, the closing question out here? Sure. Um, okay, so I'll set it up this way. Let's say now, um, now that you've sat down together, talked about the game, presumably played it together, let's say you're going to actually collaborate on a study or a research project or paper about Spider-Man. How would you go about doing that? And would you go about doing that? Um, well, I, I would... I would probably pick up the thread that we started earlier. Um, I might send Leonard a link to my article on The Last of Us and Datification, mm -hmm. <laughs> where it talks about the theoretical constructs informing the analysis right behind the differential player experience between playing as Ellie and as Joel in The Last of Us. Um, and uh, I would, I would, I would be curious if there is a way to um, to qualify and or quantify right that distinction. Yeah. Um, um, as we had spoke about earlier in relation to the, the helpers versus the primary character. Yeah, I think that's probably the, mo the most uh, promising avenue that came out of this uh, panel. Uh, definitely one of the ones that interests me the most would be to look at uh, the the impact on the experience by providing different modes of representation, um, interactive, narrative, and uh, so again we would have to come up with some sort of taxonomy, uh, what it, what that representation entails, and then systematically study that. Uh, but I think that would be actually be a highly exciting study. Gerald would provide the theory, um, we would then do the scientific study, and then we would merge again in uh, the discussion of our findings and. Uh, I think that would be a fantastic paper. Okay, deal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah look, I look forward to more reading work it. On it's your okay. Table. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, do either of you have any last minute thoughts that you wanted to get out that you didn't get a chance to say? Um, I think it's no, cool. I think we should pick another game, do this again. I think this That's is a, yeah. yeah. Okay. I had a great time. I hope you did too. <laughs> and with that, we can say goodbye. Thanks everyone for coming. Thank Let's you. Get a, yeah. Thanks.